Will you please bow your heads with me as we have a word of prayer? <clears throat> Father, this morning as we <clears throat> come here to think about things that are simple and profound, and that you'll take my crumbs and turn them into fresh bread that we all may taste and see that you are good. So please uh, bless our time this morning together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're on. Do you know what they are? <laughs> Showing my age a little bit here this morning, I guess. But uh, I was... Uh, it was, I was probably 10 or 11 years old when I bought my first record. <laughs> and uh, do you want to know what that record was? You don't? Good. Because <laughs> it's rather embarrassing. Would you like to know what that record was? Are there any DJs or ex-DJs in the house? <laughs> my first record I bought in 1978 and it was an American group. I guess I was one out of the 10 million or so around the world that bought this record, but it was actually, uh, it was the village people, YMCA. <laughs> oh my goodness me. <clears throat> Made it to uh, number one in the charts in the UK around that time. And uh, I found that as I was going through my teenage years, I started to buy more and more records and I started to play them louder and louder, much to the annoyance of my parents and our neighbors. <laughs> but I was, I was keen to blast out the sound. I, I was keen to crank out the tunes. I was, I was, I was glad to play the music with feeling, to pump up the volume. After all, music is meant for sharing, right? <laughs> and I found as well, when I bought my first few cars, and I did have one like this. This is a Ford Escort Mark II van. And I did have one of those. It wasn't those colors. It was red and white. It had white wheels and a white uh, top, but all the rest of it was red. And I found that when I bought a vehicle, I wasn't really interested in reputation or reliability or safety. In fact, when I bought my cars, it didn't matter what state the engine was in. The windshield was cracked. The bodywork was rusty. Or whether the tires were good or not. As long as it was wired for sound. And that was really all that mattered to me. And so, throughout the 80s, whether I was out in my car or at home, I found that the volume dial went up and up and up. And the music got louder and louder and louder. You know, it seemed as though I needed to increase and turn up my volume in order to decrease and shut down my pain. I turned up the volume because it felt so good. I turned up the volume to attract attention. I turned up the volume just to be like my friends. I turned up the volume to cover my insecurities. Turned up the volume so that I could escape from reality. Turned up the volume to kick against parental authority. Turned up the volume because I just didn't want to think. I turned up the volume to get some control over my life. I turned up the volume to get rest from my conscience that somehow always managed to keep bothering me when I did something wrong. 
I turned up the volume in order to shut down my pain. I turned up the volume to shut out the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. I turned up the volume to shut out the voice of God, the voice that was calling me to return and repent, the voice that was calling me to turn from death and seek life. It's a noisy world out there. Maybe you've had one of those people that come up next to you at the traffic lights, you know. The whole car is throbbing. <laughs> but the reality is, many of us like it that way. It seems like everywhere we go, there's, there's noise, there's screens, there's music and distractions. It's proliferating, it's everywhere. What's going on? There's background and not so background music in shops, fast food outlets, hotel lobbies, gas stations, restaurants, airports, sports stadiums, hospital, hospitals. It's kind of everywhere. What's up with that? What's going on? Why all of this noise? Turn up the volume. It's like our ears are under siege. Turn up the volume. It's like many around us are addicted to sound and frightened of solitude. Turn up the volume. Is there no escape? And so I question, how on earth is the God of heaven going to speak to this generation? How on earth is the God of heaven going to speak to our generation? Yet God is speaking to this generation. God is speaking to our generation. Are we listening? Is anyone listening anymore? Well, I'm here to share good news with you this morning. That God does have a final message for this noisy world. Do you want to hear it? Do you want to share it? Good. What's it all about? Who's it all about? And is there a message in here for me? So here's the deal. Here's the final countdown. This is God's last message of mercy and warning. It's found in the Apocalypse, in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. And we refer to this as the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages. And so for Youth Sabbath, here today in January, we're going to have a look at uh, the first angel's message. Revelation chapter 14, 6 and 7, so nicely read by Gabriel for us this morning. Next month, we're going to have a look at uh, the second angel's message. And then in March... We'll have a look at the third angel's message. Now I realize I'm speaking to a mixed audience here this morning. There might be some people that are here for the first time. There might be some people here that are here, or it seems like they've been here for the millionth time. Can I say to those who are maybe new amongst us, this passage of Scripture is what we as Adventists refer to as our theological crown jewels. It's a precious a precious message that's given by God to wake up a noisy world. It's time for God, I believe, to turn up His volume dial. And I believe He has the ability to crank it up. This message, the first angel's message, 
has seven main elements to it. And I'd like to just read it and share it with you again uh, from uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 14, uh, verses 6 through 7. Of course, every passage of Scripture has its context, right? And so does this one. And it comes really at the heart of the book of Revelation, a very uh, symbolic book. Uh, Pastor Michael, of course, has done a great series for us last uh, year uh, on the prophecies of the book of Daniel. And uh, we're going to be in the book of uh, Revelation today. Of course, as we uh, recognize and understand, anyone who's uh, taken these books seriously and read their messages will find out that the two books almost fit, don't they, hand in glove within each other. And the first angel's message has uh, seven elements to it. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version this morning. John, in the book of Revelation, continues to see things and hear things. He continues to see things and hear things. You know, we're all witnesses, aren't we? So the question is, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you sharing? Verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in midair. And hallelujah, he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. To every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said, in a what? In a loud voice. In the Greek, it's megalophone, megaphone, in a megaphone voice. Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come, has come, or is come. And here's the invitation worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Amen. This is a precious piece of Scripture to us as Seventh-day Adventists. And this piece of Scripture has, of course, a history. And for those of you who may be unfamiliar with our church history or denominational history, um, this message became extremely precious and worked a great revival here in America and around the world, going back, I'd say, 160, 170 years now. This message of the three angels worked a great reformation. And so, let's take a few moments this morning to look through it, to chew on it, and let's hope that this message a reformation in my heart, my life today, and in yours here at the start of this year. It starts, of course, with the gospel. Does that surprise you? God has always had good news. The difference with this message and the gospel message that's been shared by the apostles after Jesus rose again and ascended into heaven is in this message, there's an intensity to it because time is running out. The hour of God's judgment has arrived. And so God comes to you again today and to me today. Always comes with good news. Good news about your sinful condition and your need for Him. That's good news. Good news about His grace. Good news about His birth. Good news about his teachings. Good news about his life and how Jesus lived his life. The Bible tells us he went around preaching and teaching and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. He came to set us free. He came to set us free, to liberate us. So it's good news. The gospel is good news about his death. For his death, 
stands in my place. Good news about his resurrection. Good news about his ministry in the sanctuary, the true sanctuary, that's in a place where moth and rust don't destroy or corrupt. This is good news for Jesus this morning is interceding for us. And good news about His second coming. Jesus is coming again. Think about that. It's going to turn this world upside down. Hallelujah. And He has promised that He will take care of each and every one of us as we walk day by day, step by step. The good news about the Gospel is that it comes from God and it's all about God. Jesus laid down a marker in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Just like to read that text through you. You know, I was in... Uh, I was at CVA this week with the 7th and 8th graders. I tend to go in there every couple of weeks to uh, answer questions and do some Bible teaching with the 7th and 8th graders. And there was an interesting question that came up in the class this week. One of the kids had written, everyone seems to be talking about the bad things that are happening in the world. Is this the signs of the times? And if so, how can I be ready for Jesus to come? What a profound question from a young mind. But look, before the bad things happen, and you know what I'm talking about, you know the bad things that have happened already in your life, you know the bad things that have happened already to me in my life, God comes, first of all to us, with good news. It's the eternal gospel. And he's asking you this morning, he's asking me this morning to identify with him in his life, in his teachings, in his healing. Matthew 24, verse 14, this verse always excites me because this is the sign of the end. Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom... What type of kingdom is this going to be? It's not going to be the United Kingdom. It's going to be the kingdom of God coming. The king, the king is coming. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And so I'm thankful to God for his gospel invitation that heads up this message of the first angel. Comes with the eternal gospel. Good news about Jesus. I'll tell you today, with a volume up, God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's compassion, and God's love are all still available today. And so this is the gospel invitation to exchange your drifting for his purpose, your loneliness for his friendship, your emptiness for God's abundance, your uncertainty for his assurance, your fears for his love, your guilt for his peace, your desperation for his hope, your sins for the Savior, your death for his life. What a beautiful illustration that Jesus gave us to get our minds around the gospel when he said in Matthew chapter 26 and when he told us in Mark 14 the example of Mary of Magdala. Here was a person who Jesus cast out seven demons from their life. You got demons? Are you here in church this morning with demons in your life? I'll tell you, good news, Jesus can set you free. Your past does not have to cast its dark shadow on your present in Jesus Christ. And so this 
basket case of a woman who was selling her body for the temporary pleasures and for the currency of that time became sold out for Jesus Christ and came and spent probably a lot more than we all put in the offering plate this morning to prepare the body of the Lord Jesus Christ for His burial. Amen. Hallelujah for the Gospel. God comes to this world with a message of mercy and good news in these last days, friends. This message has a global reach. I can only speak English. And American English. <laughs> a little. I'm learning. <laughs> I still get those funny looks sometimes. But guess what? There are, I don't know how many languages and tongues and different tribes around the world. God will get His message through. Amen. And I'm thankful for all the missionaries that uh, sacrifice gladly their life to go out and spread the good news of the gospel in countries where it's difficult to be a Christian. Perhaps we'll see those times here uh, sometime soon. But this message uh, reinforces the Great Commission, doesn't it? That we're charged by Jesus to take our message uh, to the world, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And I like this. God, at times, can have a very loud voice if he needs to. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus, the book of Exodus, chapter 19. I want to just uh, pull out here uh, just a couple of texts to illustrate times when God showed up and he spoke and his message was clear. And his presence was abundant. Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to read through verses 16 through 19. Here's the group of liberated slaves. God has been faithful to his promise to Abraham. 100 years before he had said, you're going to come out. You're going to get through this. And here they are at the foot of Mount Sinai, three months after their great liberation, and God, who has been showing up, shows up. I love this. Genesis 19, 16 through 19. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Unfortunately, everyone in the camp trembled. That's not the kind of response that God was looking for. Verse 17, then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. It's clear, friends, that God can crank up the volume when he needs to. Then Moses spoke. And the voice of God answered him, Friends, at Sinai, the volume was cranked up. Amen. Let's turn to a passage in the New Testament here as well. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Here's another one of these examples of... The Lord speaking with a megalophone in Greek, a loud voice, megaphone voice. And we find ourselves at Calvary. The same Jesus that's returning. It's the same Jesus that was crucified for you and for me and rose again the third day. Matthew 27, verses 45 onwards. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. Try and use your imagination here. About the ninth hour, 
Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi. Lama sabachthani. Means my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? These were not said puppet fashion as if Jesus was just reciting Psalm 22 verse 1. Just matter of factly. It's wrung from the heart of a God who'd become a man. Died for you and me. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice. And we know what he said. It is finished. It was the shout of victory, my friends. Gave up his spirit. Verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open. And the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. This is assurance for our friends and our relatives who've gone before us. Who've died in Jesus Christ. The first fruits. Verse 53. They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely this was the Son of God. I think it's fair to say, friends, that when God shows up and speaks, human beings testify of divinity now this first angel's message contains uh, three Greek imperatives they are in the aorist tense which means it's a chance for God to say a start to do something and they are in the voice of command but friends all of God's commands are they not invitations all of God's warnings all of God's commands are the expression of unutterable love. And this concept of fearing God is a much misunderstood concept. And I quote from Old Testament scholar Jacques Ducan. The fear of God, he says in his book, The Secrets of Revelation. The fear of God is an often misunderstood concept. Now hear this, this is great. If your life is right with God. True fear of God is an awareness of His eyes upon us. True fear of God is an awareness of His eyes upon us. It's like a child that's playing somewhere and the father and the mother are watching. Safety. Of course, it does include the uh, concepts of reverence and respect and honor. It's a call to take God seriously. Are you taking God seriously in your life? One more quote from Professor Dukan. The fear of God has nothing to do with superstitious beliefs that paralyze and lead to a mechanical and magical religion. The Bible often associates the fear of God with love. To fear God is to love Him and to be loved by Him. It is also the assurance that God is watching over us. Turn with me to Psalm 33 verse 18. Psalm 33 verse 18. As another one of my 
well-known Adventist uh, teachers at seminary keeps saying God is not to be God is not one to be one to be afraid of God is at heart someone to be a friend of Psalm 33 verse 18 but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those whose hope is in his unfailing love fear God and give him glory this is really the flip side of the same coin someone who fears God will naturally and inevitably give him the glory because when I stand in front of the mirror as an honest middle-aged man under the conviction of God's Spirit there is not one good thing in my life that I can take the credit for and if you're honest you'd say it's the same with you too all that I have that's good comes from God and is gifted to me is loaned to me and there's a liberation in that there's a liberation in that a person who fears God will naturally give glory to him and if you look carefully through the Gospel of John the theme of glory was the one that drove Jesus life and the glory in the book of John is the cross it's his self-sacrificing love his divinity Ranko Stefanovic in his commentary on the revelation of Jesus Christ uh, says this and I quote giving God glory is the after effect of fearing him when a person when a person fears God he or she lives a life of glorifying God by keeping his commandments the Old Testament makes this very clear turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verses 13 and 14 the previous verse here is one that many students can relate to of making many books there is no end and much study wearies the body <laughs> best wishes to all you Union College CVA uh, Lincoln Southwest Lincoln East and if I've missed some out there that people are here for best best wishes for your semester uh, Ecclesiastes 12 13 and 14 now all has been heard said Solomon here is the conclusion of the matter fear God and what keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man for God will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing whether it is good or whether it is evil it has the same concept doesn't it as these uh, verses we're looking at in Revelation 14 the same kind of concepts Colossians 1 27 according to this text Christ living in us Christ being formed within us is the hope of glory Revelation 14 6 and 7 goes on to announce that God's judgment hour has come this is friends a solemn announcement but doesn't have to be a somber announcement when did according to the Bible the hour of God's judgment arrive eighteen forty four October twenty second eighteen forty four anybody here alive then so we've been born in a time of God's pre-advent judgment 
and we are still living in that hour. How is your life record standing up? Well, there's good news, friends, because if Jesus is covering your life, there's really nothing to fear. Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. Romans chapter 14 and verse 10 says this. This is in the context of Christians judging each other and looking down upon one another. Paul says these words. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. But I'd like to balance these texts with a, a text from 1 John chapter 4 as well. 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. God is love. Do you know that in the heart of your being? God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in Him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like Him. Verse 18, I love this text. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And verse 19, we love because he first loved us. It's a natural, inevitable process of feeding your mind on the Word of God. Finally, There is an invitation to worship Him. And that's why we come here, isn't it? Sabbath to Sabbath. We come here to be in God's presence, to praise Him and to thank Him, to worship Him, to give Him our all, which is quite tiny compared to all He's given us. We we come with our poverty and we take His riches. Worship Him. To know God is to love Him and to love Him is to worship Him and to worship Him is to obey His commandments, which are not burdensome. In this text, we have strong textual allusions to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, and the Sabbath commandment. God invites the whole world to come and meet with Him Friday night sunset to Saturday night sunset because He loves us. Because He loves us. To know God is to love Him and to love Him is to worship Him. But in this text, there is also an allusion to Genesis chapter 7, 11 as well. The phrase, the springs of water, comes directly out of the Septuagint version of the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures And alludes to the flood. You know we're already living on a judged planet. There's only so much. Even the mercy. And the kindness and the grace of God can take before he steps in. We are, as one author wrote. Living. On the drowned wreckage of a judged planet. Google some of those pictures that you see like Table Mountain in South Africa and some of the others around the world. You'll see if you've got eyes enlightened by the Holy Spirit that this world has already suffered a global judgment once before. And the fires also fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't need to dwell on that too much, but you know, just God is saying in this message, take take me seriously. If you get to know me and get to love me, 
you will inevitably worship me. And this is God's invitation to join him Sabbath after Sabbath and to walk as Jesus did. There's a very short section in the book, Early Writings, and I'll say this in closing. I alluded early on in the sermon to a time when this message was fresh. For many of us, it's become old hat or dull. I need to refresh these messages of the three angels once more. Messages of hope. Uh, messages of grace. Listen. Listen to the response of this first angel's message as recorded in the book Early Writings, pages 232 and 33. Wonder whether this will happen again. Wherever the message was given, it moved the people. Sinners repented, wept, and prayed for forgiveness. And those whose lives had been marked with dishonesty, dishonesty were anxious to make restitution. Parents felt the deepest solicitude or concern for their children. Those who received the message labored with their unconverted friends and relatives and with their souls bowed with the weight of the solemn message, warned and entreated them to prepare for the coming of the Son of Man. I looked very carefully at this passage this week and I was surprised to find, I was surprised to find these adjectives that described this message. Heaven sent message. Moving message. Arousing message. Solemn message. But praise the Lord. Healing message. Saving message. And I'll end with one quote from George Knight in his wonderful Adventist history devotional book, Lest We Forget. He penned this on April the 21st on that reading in his book. And then just a verse from Jesus. George Knight says this, The messages of the three angels of Revelation 14 are God's final ones to a dying world. We need to spend more time contemplating their meaning in our day. I would say amen to that. And then, just in closing here, John chapter 9 and verse 39. For Jesus is our judge. Praise the Lord. Jesus is my judge. John 9, 39, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. You decide.